everybody. Thank you for being here and thank all those online for attending this seminar. So I want to say, say uh, restate this, that this seminar is sponsored by the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, as well as the Carter, and also gets some sponsorship from uh, our UTCs um, and the facilitating from uh, IT student chapter. So IT student chapter actually usually take care of the sign sheet. So um, the transition graduate students are required to attend the seminar. And you will find from Carter website, uh, Christina actually has done a great work of job to indicate if it's virtual or in person. So if our speaker cannot join us and do it virtually online, then we will do it virtually so the students do not have to be here in Carter 202. Otherwise, if our speakers are in person, then we're requesting students to join us in person as well in Carter 202. And the good thing is that uh, we have funding from the IP student chapter to buy the pizza. So if you come over here, you can have pizza for your lunch. Okay, so um, today we have a transition professional and expert in traffic operation from a local company, uh, Mr. Pete. York, right. I hope I pronounced yeah, your, your, your name correctly. And he's a registered professional engineer in Florida. And um, he currently is a vice president with Iteris Incorporation and uh, working in their uh, Tampa office. So Peter actually has over 45 years of experience in traffic signal design and operation. And over his career, has served as a signal systems engineer for FDOT District 7, um, city traffic engineer for Clearwater, and the director of transportation for Pinellas County. So last, uh, no, in spring, actually, we celebrate the Garrett Morgan Day. Some of you probably attend that event. So Garrett Morgan was the one invented the uh, uh, like a modern style of traffic signal for the three-way uh, intersection. And it has been a long time ago. And today, actually, we're glad to have Peter to give us overview of the history of traffic signal. And we will see there has been a lot of breakthrough and also innovations occurred in that field. And actually, to synchronize the traffic signals is the most cost-effective way of improving our traffic flow. So, Peter, thank you for being with us and look forward to your presentation. Thank you. I am Pete Yaw. Um, heard a little bit of my introduction. I joined ITE 48 years ago as a student member at Georgia Tech, and uh, things have changed quite a bit since then. Um, this is going to be sort of an informal presentation, uh, definitely non technical. Uh, I am not a PhD uh, or a PhD candidate or even thought about becoming a PhD. Sort of a uh, practitioner, practitioner. And uh, I haven't used calculus since school days. Uh, so there's not going to be a, a sigma or an integral or anything in these slides. So you don't have to worry about that. You don't even really need to take, take notes. Let me start with the uh, is, is any idea of the Black bonds in Yes. Put that down there. All right. Definition out of the NUTCD on highway traffic signal. Power operated traffic control device by which traffic is warned or directed to uh, take some specific action. Doesn't include the power operated signs, blank out signs, steadily illuminated pavement markers, warning lights, uh, or steady burning electric lights. Anything that you see in construction zones, the blinkers, that's not a highway traffic signal. But this can be defined a little bit more closely. Traffic control signal is any highway traffic signal by which traffic is ultimately directed to stop and permitted to proceed. So we're really talking about intersection traffic control signals here. In the beginning, we had no traffic signals. And we had increasing traffic demands on our streets, particularly in the urban areas. We had uh, horse or strong traffic, we had pedestrians, some cars, street cars, and it just became a, a mess. We needed to handle traffic flow at our major intersections. We had chaos that just 
continued gridlock downtown's uh, indoor hall. Even road rage. Now, I bring this picture in as, you know, as the first of all, the traffic jammed up in the middle of the intersection. But then I, I notice these guys down here on the corner, and I don't know what they were doing. I'm guessing the photographer was either hanging out a window of a building or maybe up on a tall ladder. But this little hooligan looks like he's ready to throw a rock at the photographer. So I was wondering the backstory about, about that. But uh, maybe he was, uh, maybe the photographer was the traffic engineer for the city, and, and this guy had some road rage by being stuck in the intersection. So anyway, that was the issue, because we had traffic going nowhere at the major intersections. So the key was, how do you assign the right-of-way between multiple movements at an intersection? And the first cases that we dealt with were police officers directing traffic. Here's a picture from Europe. You know, they uh, long used police officers there. We had police officers like this in New York City and in other cities. Typically, they were the officers that weren't going to do a foot pursuit. They uh, had been there a while and had some donuts and uh, were able to stand and travel. Now, as an exercise for being at home, stand for about half an hour with your arms up like this and see what it feels like. You know, it starts, starts to burn a little bit, you know, keeping your hands up in the direction of traffic. And so that was a concern for police officers. So they were looking for alternative ways to direct traffic. And here was one that they had. It's just a, a sign that they could turn and, uh, you know, didn't need to have the hands up. The idea was to treat to, to ease the traffic cops work. It also could be rainy. They're out in the middle of the intersection. Could be hot, you know, bright sun. So get some shade, get some uh, protection for the rain, standing on, under the umbrella. And they found a way to even provide better indications to motors by having this mechanical device that can pull the trigger and the stop and the go would change for direction and alternate between two movements. Talk about darkness descends, but first this picture. You might look at who's in the car. It looks like a like a an expensive car. Uh, everyone everyone wears a suit back then. But my thinking is that this is the mayor and his assistant, and they're telling the uh, the traffic cops boss there that they waited too long to get to the intersection. So probably one of the first complaints about signal timing right here. What I really want to show is what happens when it gets dark is you can't see those indications. You know, they were just signs that were being turned. It was dark out in the middle of the street. So what did we do for that? We came up with colored lights. This is in Westminster, England, outside the House of Parliament, just after our Civil War, 1868. And up at the very top of this stanchion, this was a cast uh, iron stanchion in the middle of the intersection, they had a semaphore, arms that would move up and down, and a gas-powered light up at the top. And that light, you know, lenses would turn as the arms went up and down and give you a green for go or a red for stop. This seemed to work pretty well for traffic. However, about nine months after this went in, the gas, remember this was a gas light up top, gas leaked out and filled the lower portion of the stanchion and a spark lit it and the thing blew up and killed the police officer that was standing there operating. So that sort of set them back a little bit because they didn't have electric lights and sort of shine away from using gas. But to designate this location, they had this plaque, City of Westminster, John Peake Knight, inventor of the world's first traffic lights, erected there in December of 1868. So Maybe you could say this was the first traffic. Actually, if you look at data from before, it could have been traffic signals as far back as 10,000 BC. Now, this hasn't been fully documented. Uh, we used to see this a lot on TV many years ago, but uh, you know, perhaps it's real, perhaps it's not. What they did, though, was to use colored lights. Colored lights worked at night. 
and also worked during the day and could provide information to motors. So we started adding colored lights to our manually controlled traffic device. Standing in the street, still have the umbrella to protect the shade. Standing in the middle of the roadway, which is sort of a vulnerable position, and turning that umbrella sign uh, so it would be go for one street and stop for the other, and then alternating traffic flows. Different versions. There were no standards back then. We didn't have a manual on uniform traffic control devices. We didn't have an internet to see, you know, what was going on in one city so they could see what was going on in the other cities. This wasn't heavily published at the time. Everyone was sort of on their own coming up with designs for traffic signal. We also got into traffic towers. And the idea of this was to elevate the police officer up above the traffic flow so that they could be more easily seen. Same reason why we put our traffic signals on overhead mast arms and span wires so that they could be seen in advance. So these towers, this one was out in the middle of the street. Uh, uh, and you know, the officer could, could observe traffic and see how long the queues were and adjust their timings and stop and go traffic on the alternating approaches. We got into some more complex towers. We have the lights on all four sides. And we started to look more like our normal traffic signals. And finally, these towers, which are on Park Avenue in New York City. The idea with some of these long towers is that you only needed one for several intersections. Now, this is along Park Avenue and provided for traffic flow along Park Avenue. Every cross street was required to look down at the tower and see what the indication was, and then they could cross when traffic would stop. So when this went red, all traffic on Park, Park Avenue had to stop and the cross streets should go. That really didn't work too well. Again, you know, where, which intersections had traffic control? Where are you supposed to look? It worked great for locals that knew the system, but not, not good for visitors. So we had no standards, no METCD, and a police officer in Salt Lake City uh, developed a signal that uh, provided this operation. This was back in 1912. He came up with this. Now, this was a recreation prepared by Utah DOT in celebration of the 100th anniversary of this. But basically, it looked like a birdhouse with some colored lights on it. And uh, uh, that would be in the middle of the intersection, and it could be changed manually. And uh, the police officer could stay outside the intersection and standing in safety. He, uh, Mr. Wire, continued to uh, work on this idea. He came up with this, which is starting to look more like one of our, you know, four-way signals. Uh, it was some sort of a boiler or something that he got and, and lots of bits and pieces. And uh, let's go away. And basically, it provided for alternating flow of traffic out in the middle of the intersection. New York City, for many years, used the two color indications, red and green. And these signals uh, were popular throughout New York City. They were bronze. They had a statue of winged mercury on the top, very ornate, and uh, drew a lot of attention. Some, some agencies put their two colored signals out in the middle of the intersection on a pedestal. It looks like that pedestal has been hit a few times. <laughs> This is the signal that they used in Los Angeles with the semaphore arms that would alternate between go and stop. And there's two colors for this. There was a little third color here, and it was, a, it was a yellow light, but it wasn't used in the signal cycle. That yellow light was used at night. They would turn off the stop and go function, and the signal would be in flash. And so it was just yellow on all approaches back then. Since this was in Los Angeles, that's where all the cartoonists were, all the movie makers. So this was the signal that you saw in a lot of the movies and cartoons from the 40s and 50s. The Roadrunner. Roadrunner, yeah, Roadrunner had them. And the Roadrunner was great at, at painting tunnels on. Yeah. <laughs> um, this was called the uh, um, Acme signal. This is known as the Acme signal. And uh, 
uh, used throughout Los Angeles. This signal was used extensively in San Francisco, and this was the Wiley signal. It again had the red and green lights, and then the top portion was a revolving drum. And so that would turn as the signal changed and it would go from stop to go. That was the Wiley signal in San Francisco. So there were no standards. There was no MUTCD yet. So it was everyone up to their own to come up with something that worked. And all of these are still manual, right? They were manual. No, that automatic control evolved with this. Now the question is, what about the change interval? If we have only a red and green light, what's the change interval? Typically the change interval was both indications being on together. So it'd be a green and then the red would come on, the green would stay on, and then the green would go off and red would come. On. <laughs> so <laughs> no you don't like it. you don't know which way it's going. You know, you look up and both of them are on, do you do you accelerate or do you come to a stop? Accelerate always. Always accelerate. <laughs> Probably not the right answer. Who knows who Shirley Temple is? Oh, God. <laughs> yes. Oh, <laughs> oh Shirley Temple was a real person. It wasn't just the, the just drink, the cocktail drink. with the grenadine and the bottom yeah. of the ginger ale. Shirley Temple was a movie star in the 30s. And so, you know, again, movie star, Los Angeles signal. There with the, the Acme signal. She later served as a U.S. ambassador to Czechoslovakia. Which goes to show if you get involved in signals at an early age, and you want to great things. Okay. New York City, here's that uh, bronze signal with winged mercury on top, and everyone's standing around it as if this is the biggest tourist attraction in town. This was a big thing, traffic signals in, in uh, uh, New York City. Uh, very impressive to see that, that, that uh, interest. Everyone dressed up for the occasion, too. They later changed from that bronze version to this uh, uh, two color signal. And these were in place until probably the 70s. I remember being in New York City in the late 70s and still seeing some of these in operation. Same thing, both colors coming on at the same time. Here's a picture uh, from the 70s and you can see each of these. And this is a simultaneous system. All of them changed green to green at the same time. So, they were around for quite a while. Of course, when you've got, I don't know, 15,000 signalized intersections in a city, you don't necessarily want to replace them all with three colored signals. Now, William Potts with the Detroit Police Department, 1920, came up with a signal. And that was a three color signal. That was made out of tin and plywood and some colored lights and manually controlled. That was really probably the first three color signal. And we talked about Garrett Morgan. Garrett Morgan was an inventor, came up with a traffic signal, came up with a, a gas mask, number of other uh, inventions. This is his patent. And really his claim is that it was the first patented traffic signal that included a change interval. It had the semaphore, but it had a mode where the semaphore came put together that change interval. And that concept was worked into the, uh, the evolving three color traffic signals so that we've got this operation of green to yellow to clear vehicles and then to red. Again, there were no standards for this for quite a while. Signal on the left used rectangular lenses that had word messages in them. Stop, change, and go. They had different shapes. Uh, some of them were fixed four ways. This one was adjustable so it could be aimed in all directions. Fixed four way, putting them still out in the middle of the intersection. Uh, those concrete foundations sticking up, we call them tank traps. Uh, if you're in the safety side of things, those are the uh, fixed obstacles that we want to get rid of. Why did you call it a tank trap? From from military time, tanks. They would put these big concrete blocks oh, tanks to the metal through. So it was a tank trap. Okay. Right, try to stop the tanks. We got into art deco signals, you know, make traffic signals decorative for the downtown areas. Like that. 
Now they're a fancy one, you know, make them real decorative. Um, they were they were the attractions for downtown. This one had it says left turn signal there, it's still in place, but this went in, in the 30s as the signal for the intersection. And uh, you know, a little fountain in there, and uh, uh, it wasn't left turn signal at the time, it was just the signal for the intersection. And you sort of used it like a roundabout, you go around that circle uh, on the green line. Times have changed. How did we illuminate those? Well, we didn't use gas because we found that gas didn't work very well. Light bulbs were used. This signal was called a Darley simplex. It was a Darley was a manufacturer still still in business making fire uh, engine equipment. But you'll note that there's a single light bulb through the three sections. How does that work? Well, in two directions, red was on top. The other two directions, green was on top. So the bottom light bulb would be on to be green in one direction and red in that direction. <laughs> and then the yellow would come on and be yellow in all directions. And then the red up here, the red this way, green this way. And those were, you find these in smaller towns. Um, number one, they were very inexpensive. This is a two color darling, same thing, two light bulbs for the whole, whole intersection. But you could get a signal that included the building controllers for $67.50. <laughs> what a deal. And you got a 3% discount if you send cash for the order. So how did how to stretch your transportation dollars and save energy? I had two light bulbs. Going on about illumination. This is what we eventually ended up with for years. And that was an incandescent lamp in a parabolic reflector and a colored glass lens that had um, diffracting uh, elements built into it. So that you had a, a, an indication that sort of lit up the entire area of the lens. And it was a bright indication. That was typically, uh, that was uh, a household lamp designed to last about 8,000 hours. Yeah. So the six seven point five dollar, what is the equivalent dollar of today? And is our signal now more expensive than back that time? We built a signalized intersection now with mass arms and signal heads and controller and everything. Uh, they're running about three hundred thousand. Three hundred thousand dollars. So yeah. So yeah. <laughs> but we can do a lot more with these signals because that that last thing just did its thing all day long, just the uh, same so, cycle, same split. So that 67 is probably equivalent to 10K, 20K of today's value, if you know more. That was back, those, those are still available in the 40s, 50s. They were still in a lot of smaller towns. Drive through uh, the small towns in the south and you can see those. I've got one that came from, uh, uh, came from Bartow, uh, but I've got the uh, friend many years ago. But anyway, this is how the signals provided the, the lamp indication. And then about 15, 20 years ago, we went with LEDs. Now, I remember in, when I was in school, so that was 50 years ago, having an LED watch with little red pixels. They started talking, well, we're going to light up traffic signals with LEDs. It was like, sure. <laughs> but LED technology evolved quite a bit, much more reliable much less energy costs. So compare that 135 watt lamp to about a six watt lamp. This changes a little bit based on the color, but this is about six to eight watts of these. If you've got an intersection with left turn displays, through signals, you know, dual through signals, pedestrian indications and all that, just the electricity to run that is about the equivalent of a small house. So by going to LEDs, we had much lower energy costs um, and much more reliable. Bulbs didn't burn out. Now we still have failures with LEDs, but nowhere near as much as we did. We'd have to basically go out and relamp intersections every uh, nine months or so because of the anticipated life. And the Main Street greens and the side street reds would have shorter life than than the yellows. So. 
we could uh, save some money by doing that. But just being out in the middle of the intersection trying to change indications was dangerous and provides a risk. There are some other standards uh, used around the, or other devices used around the country, uh, or around the world. No standards. I'm not sure where this is. It looks uh, possibly German to me. But basically, the hands of that clock spin around, and that's your signal indication. We had this rotating device that uh, would provide a stop and a go. It's kind of like the, uh, the uh, uh, Wiley signal from San Francisco in that it had the two colors and also a, a moving device that would tell you whether to stop and go. And this thing, which also clock motors, and it could be used for a, an intersection and make sure you're green, yellow, and red. This showed pedestrian times, but it could also have a side street movement on that. And continued on variations. Um, and I think what they were trying to do here was to show how much time you had remaining. As you got time to change, it would light up more and more indications. Sort of the reverse of the uh, Christmas tree at a drag strip. <laughs> Here is one that was developed as a means of showing when you had a left turn movement or when you can make a left turns. Single section and these outside indications would come on. This is in Tipperary Hill outside of Syracuse, New York. And this is a modern photograph. This is perhaps the only intersection in the U.S. where the green remains on top. The history of this is that it was an Irish community and they had one of those signals that had green on top in two directions and the DOT came in and updated the current standards and the local kids started throwing rocks at it because they wanted green on top and it continued on and the only way to stop the vandalism was to put this signal and so there's this is well known they had, uh, had a stamp uh, by the post office that had this signal on um, it's kind of unique if you're ever in the uh, Syracuse, drive by. So the moral of that story is rowdy teenagers can get stuff done too. Yes, rowdy teenagers can. And <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if the same guys in that earlier photo <laughs> throwing rocks at the photographer. This was an interesting design. It uh, had a colored lens that would sort of change. This this black arm would move around and it had like two filters that would change. Give you a green or a red indication. Kind of strange looking. Like an alien. And this, you've probably seen this. This is decoration. This is somewhere over in Germany or somewhere, but it's it's in a park. But, uh, just showing how how much we depend on traffic signals. We started to get some standards in May of 1930. There was a national conference on street and highway safety first big national conference on this issue. And they came up with some recommendations, which included the meaning of colors in a three color system and the meaning of colors in a two color system. So it defined you know, and recognized that some agencies were using three colors, some agencies were using two colors. That was the start of our standards, our national standards, and really the start of the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, which came out, first edition came out in 1935, first edition MET speed, and it required three color system system. They decided to get away from the two color system. 1935, New York City still had them in place in the mid 70s, so it didn't turn around very quickly. <laughs> It also allowed to have arrow indications for left turn movements, and it allowed pedestrian indications walk and wait. Now, if you're standing on a street corner and you're looking at a lighted indication and it starts with WA, do you know if the last two letters are LK or IT? So that is why in future signals, we went from wait, don't walk. And then ultimately, to the hand and man. Standards continue to evolve. The NETCD, this is the current edition. There's a new edition coming out very soon. It was promised to be out about three months ago. 
Um, but the lawyers and the U.S. government are still going through it. It's my understanding that the technical folks are done, but everyone wants to make sure that uh, it's all legal. Um, that should be coming out shortly. But in 1961, we first required dual displays. You got to have two indications for the major movement on each approach. Why? Because if one light bulb burned out, you've got nothing displaying. And if you've got a big truck, perhaps you can see around it. So two displays were required. In 1971, 71 was a major rewrite of the NHCD, and there were lots of things. It's when we first went to symbolic signs. Um, but in signals, we introduced the yellow and red arrow. And used those in the past. And we defined worded pedestrian signals that had to be don't walk and walk while waiting. 2000, we introduced the symbolic pedestrian signals, the hand and man. And in 2009, we required the countdown pedestrian signals. There's been experimentation over the years of traffic safety. And, and a lot of that is focused on telling drivers how soon is the light going to turn yellow. This was uh, in the mid 60s. This is the company out of Texas that developed this. And in the yellow section, nine seconds before the start of the yellow, it would start counting down like a scoreboard clock. Nine, eight, seven. Green would still be on, but he's counting down. When it reached zero, green would go out, and this would light up entirely. This location was a test location on Gulf Bay at Belcher in Clearwater. There was a test location in Tallahassee as well. They put this in and kept track of the crashes. Crashes went up about 50% when the signal went in. What happened was some people would see that yellow light come in and think, oh, it's going to change. I'm going to stop. Others would see that countdown start and think, oh, it's going to change. I need to speed up and get up early. And, you know, as we learned in early physics, Two particles can't occupy the same space at the same time. And so that's when we get crashes. So after about six months, this came down. This is another one designed to show how much green was remaining. I don't know that. Is that, that real? It, it was built. I don't know if it was ever installed on the street. Definitely not in the US because it never went through the experimentation. Now there is a process. If you want to nowadays, if you want to experiment with a change or, or a change in operation of a signal or any traffic control device it has to go through a request to experiment with the federal highway administration mm -hmm. and and in fact this one i think had the green but also had red and would show how much red time this really only works in the free time signal anyway mm -hmm. so man how valuable is it and then there's this one that was showing how much red time was remaining. You know, different ideas. Uh, this was not also not used in the U.S., but uh, you know people always come up with ideas and patenting them. Pedestrian signals we talked about briefly. Here's the early walk and wait. There was a round lens, same as the traffic signal lens. But, uh, uh, walk in white and the wait in orange. And we've kept those colors to this day. Some agencies would have just the walk indication and uh, all traffic would stop in all directions. You could cross in any direction during that walk. Um, became uh, that concept became known as the Barnes dance after Henry Barnes, who was traffic minister in Denver, Baltimore, and New York City. And he developed this thing where pedestrians could cross in any direction. Uh, that has its impacts and capacity. But uh, pedestrians are cars. Always the balance. And we had form neon tubes at the uh, don't walk and walk. You know, those neon was big in those days. Now, the question is in your black and white photo, was this guy wearing the proper protective equipment? I doubt. Of course, it was the whole world was black and white at that time. We didn't have colors. We, we had neon grid. I'm, I'm glad Jody's getting these jokes. We had neon grids behind stencil pedestrian indication. We had the walk and wait incandescent lamps and form neon letters and just different types of signals that have had to evolve. But we finally have basically standardized on these as being our standard pedestrian zones. 
Now, signal control. How did we do it? We started out manually. This is the cops standing there changing the, the flags, the signs at the intersection. They could manually control the intersection. And they had a little control box. The example here is what New York City had and this removable handle that the cop would bring. And when it was time to control it, he could just basically shift it from one direction to the other. And it would change the contacts in the box and change the signal indications. Um, expensive to have police officers standing there on the track. So we wanted to get away from that. We came up with some very early fixed times. There's small cabinets on the corner. And again, you know, these aren't just signal texts that are nicely dressed. Uh, we figured out who this was. You know, here's the traffic signals engineer. He has this pained expression. You got the public works director over here. And this is the mayor, and he's telling them how he wants to be able to drive to work without stopping every day. So he's setting the timings for his direction of travel, and these guys are going along with him because they work for the mayor. <laughs> Signal controls, we use these for a long, long time. This is uh, sort of the standard for electro electromechanical signals. A small box, uh, and these were generally used downtown areas. Um, we could change patterns. We had the possibility of three side points. So we had some time blocks. One, you know, these two time blocks would call for side point two and side point three. This third time block would call for it to go to flash at night. We used to flash a lot of signals at night to minimize delay. So close up, each of those timing dials had a dial that was divided into 100 slots. And within those slots, you could put in metal keys, and those metal keys had tabs on them in different positions. And on top of this dial were little fingers that rode on the top of the dial. And as the key went by, it would push up on the finger and close the contact. So you would have a key to advance one indication for the signal. And there was one key that was a reset key, so that the dial kept in, in relationship with the signal indication. So you could have a 30 second yellow and a five second green. And um, behind this, there was a, a fixed speed motor, but we had different gears. And so we could get the gear for a 70 second cycle or an 80 second cycle or whatever. That would be behind that diagonal, and that we could have three diagonals in the controller. Behind these dials, you'd have a camshaft, and this camshaft also had fingers that controlled the power that went to the signals in the street. So they would have either a, a raised section or a removed section. This one, you go metal inserts on this one. And so every time you get a click from one of these, this would advance one step. That's what changed the colors of the street. We realized early on that we needed to have coordination. And I won't get into a lot of detail about coordination, but basically, we wanted to try to get traffic moving along the street, looking headed south on the street over here. We wanted to get them so if they go through a green here, they go through a green here, and so on. Which means that those two signals, or three signals, or how many signals on the border, have to stay in step. They have to run on the same cycle length. They have to be interconnected in some, some way because electric power varies by location. You can have drift, you know, particularly if we're talking about electric clocks. You know, they drift. Sometimes they don't change at all like that one up there. <laughs> so what we did was a very simple interconnect, seven wires. Traffic signal cable, you know, 14 gauge wire running along the intersection. And at one point, it didn't have to be at the end. You had a master controller that had those the time blocks on the door. We call different dials, and and uh, we call flash. So it's generating 110 volt of power that goes out over this interconnect, and then each of the local controllers are connected to that, and you can keep. The intersection in step with the master controller through this very simple interface system.
we started to get into actuated controllers in the 30s. Um, and uh, there were some early manufacturers and actuated just means that the signal changes the timing and sequence based on vehicle demand or pedestrian demand. Variety of these, they would vary the timing. Um, uh, you provide a minimum green, some additional green for each additional car that comes up, yellow and the red. That was a very basic operation. We got into some very complex operations. This was still a two phase signal, but look at all the timing intervals that this thing had up. This was volume density, which they were promoting back then as being a, a way of maximizing their efficiency. Again, the signal timing engineer dressed to go into the cabin. And then as we got into more complex intersections, we had like this type of controller in a cabinet, and then we had these little units which were needed for each left turn loops. So if you had a, a quad left intersection that turns in all directions, you would typically need you know, your master controller and then four of these and the wires between them and it was complex intersection and to, to maintain, difficult to maintain, and there was no contact monitor. So if you had a fall, if you had a relay go back, you could have greens in, in, in all directions. directions. Mm -hmm. In all directions. In all directions, in conflicting directions, yeah. So that was, I mean, this is the standard of the 60s. And here's again one of these in the 60s. You can see uh, this is the basic two phase operation initial extension, max. Yellow and all red. Basic operation. Fun to listen to them, all the relays, et cetera. Then we came up with uh, controllers that did this electronically. And this is what we started to see in the 70s. Back then, electronics were expensive. And so, two phase controller, we had these modules. If you wanted a three phase controller, add another module. We're typically using eight phase everywhere because they've simplified it so much. So, in 1976, NEMA, the National Electrical Manufacturers Association, came up with their first set of standards, ES1, for traffic signals. And this was because every manufacturer had their own design, own wiring, and if you had a failure of one intersection and you didn't have a spare for that same manufacturer, you had a problem. So they came up to, with standards to have them interchangeable by defining how they work and defining these three circular connectors, the A, B, and C connectors. What, what functions go on what pins? And so you could replace, this is transit, which became peak, uh, made in Tallahassee, but you could replace that with one from Eagle or Cross Lines to keep the intersection working. It turned out that TS1 standards weren't enough for modern traffic needs. We got into the TS2 standards um, in the mid-90s, and uh, that gave us more power, more capabilities. Concurrent to the TS1 effort, California and New York State and Federal Highway were together in developing a specification, as opposed to a standard, specification for a general purpose controller, the 170. The 170 well, go back to NEMA. This was, a, this was an actuated intersection control. That's all it did. The 170, you had this PROM module. So you could put in your own programming and you could make it a ramp metering controller, uh, an arterial master controller, uh, an intersection controller. Caltrans used it for controlling irrigation on a freeway system. So it was a general purpose machine. And uh, that evolved into the 2070. Again, you know, some of the, the, the components in the 170 became obsolete. Memory, every memory capabilities changed because of the 2070. And that has been superseded by the advanced transportation controller, which we're seeing, which allows you to do things like automated traffic signal performance measures and uh, transit priority and all that, a lot more power. Centralized control systems. In the 70s, Federal Highway Administration promoted uh, what was called their UTCS, Urban Traffic Control System, uh, software. And uh, 
provided it to a number of cities for demonstration projects for centralized traffic control. City of Clearwater was one of those, yet one of the first centralized internet ECCS software. And you know, it ran on a mainframe computer. And it communicated with each of them, each signal once per second. Now, this, this had a removable hard drive. Okay. So a platter about this big, and it was 10 megs. Now I have a thumb drive. And this PowerPoint presentation that we had there, what came in at about uh, 110 megs with all these photographs on. So this platter didn't have much memory. And definitely the internal storage in this computer was minimal. So the programming was a lot of it was reading a routine from the disk drive, processing it, and then writing it back to the disk drive. So the disk drive was running all the time. We communicated with each signalized intersection once per second, and we'd send at 1200 baud, you know, low speed. And so we send basically full force off, you know, hold online, four or five commands to the intersection. And uh, then we get a response back of what signals were green, and it would process that and make adjustments. If you lost communications for a second, go out of step. When this was first kind of uh, demonstrated, how what was the connection between the signals and the um, central control? Typically, twisted pair, copper wire, telephone wire. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, and, and twelve hundred baht. And so it was prone to lightning, prone to noise, uh, prone to rodents chewing on, uh, like like fibers from the back of us, but uh, you know, like too much like that. But it was it was slow. Okay, and, that also, but they weren't really stealing it. As huh? Prone to theft also, but they weren't stealing it. As they, they weren't stealing it back. They, they are, yeah. But you had for each group of about eight signals, you had two pairs. One for transmit, one for receive, and uh, and, and you were really limited to eight just because of the timeline of talking to each intersection in sequence. Time division multiplexing, uh, frequency shift being TM investigated, we call it back then. But it worked, and it demonstrated that we could control signals from a centralized location. Things evolved. We got into with the advent of the personal computer in the uh, mid 80s. We had closed loop systems where we could use a dial up modem, 80s modem, dial up to the on street master, and then that master would communicate with adjacent signals along the border. So this has definitely changed. If you've been, and, and I don't know if you've had tours, the city of Tampa, Hillsborough County, their traffic man management center. Yeah, this has definitely evolved significantly. This map display, you know, these these were expensive, but behind each intersection was an indicator for the green and red light. And you could look at it and say, okay, that's green in this direction, or that's offline, or, or whatever. They just kind of made those a good business for a short while. Detection, which goes to actuation. Or with the actuating controls. The trail was one of the first means of actuating a controller. What are we doing on time? Not 10 minutes. Yeah, 10 minutes. Basically, two metal plates with a little rubber separator on the edge, and then it's the card over to put the plates together, closing a circuit. We also did some work with microphone detectors. Time says stop. Sound horn to clear signal. And this one to obtain signal, stop, blow horn. <laughs> it would listen for that horn indication, close the close the relay, and put in a call to the controller. Now, the people that lived in the house on the corner probably did not like this operation. In particular, it ran all night. We got into some microwave detection in the 60s and 70s, such as this. And then we got into loops. Inductive loops have been our standard for probably 50 to 60 years. Uh, it's uh, intrusive. You've got to close a lane to work on it, but it's reliable and you know what the detection is going to be. 
we now get into video detection. And just like your ring doorbell senses someone moving or walking up to the door, the senses the motion of cars, we can we can program an area of, of interest and as a vehicle goes through it, it senses that and puts in a call to the controller. And microwave detection such as this. Same sort of thing, it's predefined zone and can sense when there's a vehicle coming through. Pedestrian detection, push buttons have been in the way for three years. They've changed uh, in appearance. Um, there were some back in the 50s that would have an indicator that showed that your call was received. We went away from that for 40 or 50 years, and now we're starting to get it back. We now have more advanced, safe, accessible pedestrian signals, which provide that feedback indication, which provide indications for the visually impaired, what way the crossing is, and provide audio, audio information on what the signal indications are. And we're getting into passive detection for pedestrians as well. It can sense uh, pedestrians waiting on the curb or in the process of crossing the street. So what's the future hold? One of the most significant things has been the public right of way accessibility guidelines, which was, uh, or PROWAG, which was uh, uh, developed related to ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And this says, this really focuses for our interest on pedestrian segmentations. The guidelines were published um, about a month ago. Uh, Federal Highway Administration has yet to adopt them, but it is anticipated that they will adopt them. And essentially, they're going to require accessible pedestrian signals at every intersection. So we'll see a lot more of that in the future. The Manual and Uniform Traffic Control Devices 11th edition. We've seen the draft of it. Um, and we know that they, the Federal Highway received about 20,000 comments based on that draft. So we don't know what the final version is going to look like, but uh, there may be some, some changes to what we see in our signal indications or, or our signal control. Connected vehicle technology is what is really driving a lot of, of change. And uh, you've got dashboard indications that tell you what the signals are, how soon they're changing. Uh, the, car can chime if the signal has changed so you can put your phone down and, and start driving again. And autonomous vehicle, vehicle technology. What are we going to do when the cars are all driving themselves? Do we need colored lights in the intersection at all? So with that, I appreciate your time. The feature was great. <laughs> Any questions here? Yeah, uh, question. Uh, so currently, what is the major problem uh, or issues uh, for development of intersection signaling or production of the signal itself. So, uh, yeah, I want to know that if what is the major issue? Right? What are the major issues now? Yeah, what is the, the major issue in creating signaling, the safety uh, on intersection? Yeah. I We've got technology, but one of our major issues is staff, is workforce development, because we don't have the people that can use the technology at its most effective rate by maintaining it. Now, the, the technology is so far advanced, and a lot of our folks that do you know, the maintenance are, are really used to changing light bulbs and changing fuel systems and not looking at the technology that's involved. And we're building on top of that with roadside units for connected vehicles and all. And so that's changing. The technology of maintenance is changing. Um, there's also basically timing development. How do we maximize the most efficient timing? We get into adaptive traffic signal systems that can change timing to fix the demand. Uh, some of those work, some of them don't. Depends on the board or what we're finding. So um, I think it still is an issue. I think it's an issue, and the models are based on heavily data-driven um, requirements. So you got to go out and do turning with the caps. 
Well, ATSDM didn't provide training movement counts if we got all the detection and the high power control. So it's it's evolving, but I think workforce development is a, is a key thing. So one other question sir, uh, is that so is it possible that in the future we eliminate the signals because on the street holding center is really a thing for the future? So maybe in the future we don't even see signaling on the intersection. Are are we ever going to have a totally autonomous people going to give up their right to drive their car if they want to drive? You know, it's great to be like the Jetsons. Well, the Jetsons were going through the air. You know, just getting a getting a vehicle and and everyone going all around with these automated vehicles. That'd be great from a safety standpoint for sure. Um, but uh, are you going to drive them out of their car? Or their motorcycles, or their Corvettes, or so those kinds of vehicles that they drive yeah. because for fun, not just to get from one place to another. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, there's obviously lots of conversations going on about data signals and, and connected vehicles and integrated corridor management. But what is the attitude towards like the resilience of these these uh, solutions when it comes to like, severe weather, or cyber attacks, or even just like power outages? Like, you know, I feel like there's a lot of hope, hopeful thinking that we'll be able to rely on these types of solutions in the future, but I mean, is it going to be as reliable as we'd like it to be? I think it's an area we need to work on. Um, for example, severe weather. Um, this last storm that went out, what was the uh, Idalia or whatever? Um, I was monitoring travel times in the Tampa Bay area during that and keeping an eye on 511 and all. All the cameras on I 10, and I was part of I 75, went out before the storm even hit. We can't have that. We, we, I mean, we're looking at evacuation. So we've got to have redundancy, uh, resilience to storm events. Cybersecurity is a new issue. Now, there was a movie about 20 years ago called The Italian Drop. And in that, people hacked into the signal system and made signals go pretty well. Yeah, we can't do that. There's a conflict on there. there. But we had in 2012, I was with Pinellas County at the time. We had the Republican National Convention in Tampa. And we were running on the signal system in Nelson County. And we had a meeting with the advanced security team, the guys that, you know, talking with their sleeves and where you're at best all the time. And they told us about things that can happen with the signal systems. And uh, even, even changing the timing so that you have to stop at every signal will create gridlock. So it's, it's not just Conflicting dreams, but just you know, put the timing so far out of sync that no one's moving. Um, and you can do that. Number two key to get into the controller cabinet, you can get on eBay for about 10 bucks. Um, and once you're in, if there's a switch in there, you plug into the switch and you're in their system. Yeah. I agree to achieve 100% automated vehicle. It's really far, far away, or maybe never ever we can achieve, uh, get there. How about 100% of connectivity? Like make the vehicles become connected, and if the old vehicles or not autonomous vehicles, you still have some devices can retrofit in a vehicle. And if we have that, can we have in the future virtual traffic signal instead of physical traffic signal? Because you can send all the information to the vehicle, and there's some either visualization or some system to help the driver to get the information of the signal timing? Ideally, yes. And perhaps, you know, we're going to reach a point where all vehicles were purchased after they became standard. Mm -hmm. Now, I drive a vehicle that's a little bit higher up over the roadway so I can see other people's dashes when driving. And often I see a yellow light on your dash because the fire sensor is bad or some, something was bad. What <laughs> if one of these sensors for the connected vehicle is bad? Are you going to stop driving and take it into a shop and get it very readily? If it doesn't, impede your people to drive. So we've got to get an agreement or have so reliable equipment that the connectivity isn't going to fail. 
So we'd have to go back. Plus, you've got pedestrians that have to cross. So, uh, and bicyclists. Are we how are we communicating with them when you say you cross? So I, I I think you know the reason to be around one. Feeling personally attacked by that response. <laughs> we have a question online. Okay. Um, they, if they say, uh, let me get through. They gave me a lot of, you know, great presentation, all that good stuff. The actual question, um, if traffic signal control intersects, intersections that have more red, red light tickets are monitored and do you analyze causality? And what's the normal acceptable red ticket frequency for a day? Oh, um, I'm I'm seeing red light violations as sort of an indication of congestion levels. Um, you know, there was an investigated reporter here about ten years ago that said, "Oh, you know, Keith Crawford, <laughs> not me, you know, Keith, yeah, reduce the." Red, or the yellow time at this intersection by a tenth of a second. And that created X number of additional tickets. And that just shows that there's this connection point. No one who does signal timing even talks to the people that are doing red light damage. Now, we're doing through the scanning, and uh, you know, we're not uh, colluding with them to increase revenue. Um, even though that's what this investigative report, we want an Emmy for it, by the way. Uh, yeah, well, it's not true. That's from my question immediately. But yeah, I think if you've got a major red light running problem, the whole thing is identify traffic engineering solution countermeasures first. And then if you're still having a red light issue, then you get into the enforcement procedure and make it reasonable. Um, yeah. we, the yellow formula that we use was never based on a tenth of a second resolution. Yeah. <laughs> so, still be reasonable. <laughs> Anything else online? Or it looks like the pizza get cold. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's still in this bag. It's okay. Any other questions from our audience online in person? Maybe, maybe a nice picture. Oh, yeah. Let's come in. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, great. Uh, first of all, let's give a round of applause to you.